Lo Go ahead. So as a reminder, last week, we were talking about cellular respiration, right? And in that process, basically what we have, we have carbohydrates, right? <coughs> that are digested in the intestine to basically glucose. Glucose is further broken down to glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate, G3B, which is converted to pyruvate. And finally, pyruvate is converted to acetyl CoA, which enters the Krebs cycle. So this is your pretty straightforward metabolism of carbohydrates. Does that make sense? Now, um, I'm going to demonstrate why consuming high-fat, low-carbohydrate diet leads to the weight loss. Okay? So, a couple of things before we start, actually, with this. So, imagine that you are eating a huge bowl of pasta. Okay, you with me on that? So your blood, your blood carbohydrate levels go really high. You, you know, you consume a lot of carbs, right? So glucose enters your cells, and remember, what is the kind of the final, final goal of this process? It is to generate ATP. That makes sense. Now, can we store energy in the form of ATP? The answer is no, we can't. ATP levels in the cell can rise only so much. So at some point, look, and this is important, at some point, the ATP levels will substantially go up, right? Does that make sense? Everybody's on board about that, okay? And this will actually have an inhibitory effect on this entire pathway. Are you with me? So elevated ATP levels will slow down, uh, actually they will slow down the glycolysis, they will inhibit this step. That make sense? Now, it's really fascinating. Your cells reached the top level of ATP, does that make sense? But glucose keeps coming. So what do you do with this? If glucose keeps coming, you have to store it in some form, right? And the form of storage for glucose is going to be glycogen. Are we clear? Now, can you store as much glycogen as you want or is there some kind of a some kind of a limit to that storage? There's a limit. You store it in the liver, you store it in the muscles, you reach the glycogen storage capacity, but glucose keeps coming. So, how are you going to store all those excessive calories in the form of what? Fat. And this is how it's going to happen. So, G3P will be converted to glycerol. Does that make sense? And acetyl-CoA will be converted to fatty acids. And then glycerol and fatty acids will be combined to form to glycerides. Does that make sense? This is fat. Are you following me here? Now, this is what happens, and what is, the, what is the diet that was actively promoted in the American nutrition? It was high carbohydrate, low fat diet, because the idea was low fat will result in a weight loss, right? Are you following me on this one? Well, if you eat high carbohydrate diet, all the excessive carbohydrates, you know, will be 
metabolized to glycerol fatty acids to triglycerides, right? Are you following me on this? So this, in this direction, I can put it like this arrow, this is lipogenesis. Now imagine for a second that you are, listen, that you are eating the low carbohydrate, high fat diet, which is also known as Atkins diet, okay? If you're doing that, like you have very little glucose coming in. Does that make sense to you all? Do you need glucose? Do your cells need glucose? Which cells in particular? One organ that absolutely adores glucose. Brain. The brain. This is why you have munchies when you study. Okay? That makes sense? So, but you're not getting any glucose from your diet because you're eating high fat. Does that make sense? So, you have a lot of incoming fat. And now triglycerides being broken down to glycerol and fatty acids. Does that make sense? And specifically, check this out, fatty acids in the process called beta oxidation, they are converted into acetyl-CoA. Are we clear? So in this direction, when process goes in this direction, this is called lipolysis. Does that make sense? So when you start consuming, sorry, when you start consuming low carbohydrate, high fat diet, you basically burning fat, including yours. Does that make sense? Are we clear? Now, there is another interesting feature that happens when, when you do this. If you decide to go all in and abandon carbohydrates completely, this is what's going to happen. One of the intermediates in Krebs cycle is called oxaloacetate. Oxaloacetate from the Krebs cycle will be used, so I'm going to put oxaloacetate, will be used to produce glucose in the process known as gluconeogenesis. Does that make sense? So oxaloacetate from the Krebs cycle is used to make glucose because, as we just discussed, your brain really needs glucose. Am I clear? Now, if you take one element of a chemical cycle and start using it for something else, can this cycle occur? No, it stops, right? And you have a huge amount of acetyl-CoA accumulating. Am I clear? Let me say it again. If you take oxaloacetate from the Krebs cycle and use it for glucose synthesis, Krebs cycle is being disrupted. Are you following me? When it is being disrupted, acetyl-CoA has nowhere to go. Are you following me? So in this case, acetyl-CoA, okay, I'm going to put no oxaloacetate. Acetyl-CoA in the liver will be converted into ketone bodies. Have you heard about ketosis and or ketogenic diet? This is exactly what happens here. Okay? Does that make sense? Now, if you look at this schematics so far, you can ask, what is the difference between the ketosis that is dietary induced and ketosis that is the result of a lack of insulin in the person with diabetes? Well, in let's say if 
a relatively healthy adult like me would go on to the ketogenic diet, I would have a lot of ketone bodies flowing in my blood, but my cells will be able to uptake it, are you following me, and use it as a source of energy. They are a really efficient source of energy. Does that make sense? Clear? Now, <coughs> sorry. In a person with diabetes, even the uptake of ketone bodies is problematic. So despite the fact that ketone bodies are actively formed, cells can't properly take them in and use them as the energy source. Am I clear? So far. Now, a couple of real life things. So first of all, I already mentioned that saturated fats are not associated with increased risk of atherosclerosis, dietary saturated fats. Okay. So what does that mean for us in terms of the diet? It turns out that in principle, high fat, low carbohydrate diet is better at controlling body weight than the other way around. Does that make sense? There actually was a study, a really interesting study, demonstrating that. So there were two groups of people, listen, two groups of people who were overweight, okay? And one group received high carbohydrate diet, low fat. Are you with me? And what they were doing, they were counting calories. So they were doing calorie restriction on high carb diet. And another group received high fat diet. So they were running the whole lipolysis thing with ketone bodies and stuff. Basically, they were on a ketogenic diet. Does that make sense? Without calorie control. Turns out that without calorie control, it works just as well as high carb with a calorie control. One of the possible reasons high fat diet gives you a feeling of satiety much faster. So you don't overeat. Does that make sense? Are we clear? Now, given, I don't know if you ever tried to go into full ketosis. Um, I did not, did not try to go into full ketosis, but people who did describe it as a torture because you, you, you're feeling tired all the time. Initially, then you kind of get used to it. Um, and, you know, it, it takes some time for metabolism to change. One of the sort of offshoots of this whole conversation is a phenomenon known to people who run long distances, like I do, hitting the wall. You familiar with that phenomenon? When you run, 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 then you just can't. So usually we eat, well, hopefully we eat balanced diets, you know, with uh, carbohydrates and fats, but when you run, you, your cells, your muscles operate mostly on the glycogen storage, okay? And when your muscles and your liver run out of glycogen storage, by the way, let's name it, it's glycogenesis. When they run out of glycogen storage, they have to switch to fat metabolism. Does that make sense? And that moment when glycogen storage is depleted, but cells did not switch to fat metabolism yet, is the wall. This is why some ultra-marathon runners and marathon runners, they actually live in the state of ketosis all the time. So when they run, they basically from the, the start, literally from the start, they don't have glycogen storage. Does that make sense? Like, they don't store anything here. This, the glycogen storage, will happen only if you have excessive carbohydrates. They don't have them. They don't have carbohydrates at all. So they run on the fats all the time. It's much denser energy storage. So basically, they can, I don't know, they don't have all these energy gels. They don't need any carbohydrates during the race. Does that make sense? It's doable. Now, what about proteins? With the proteins, the story is interesting. So, 
um, when you consume proteins, okay, they are broken down to amino acids. And then uh, you have two options. So these amino acids can be used for actual protein synthesis, you know, muscle grow and growing and stuff like that. Okay, are you following me? But some of the amino acids will be inevitably catabolized. And what you need to know is that the catabolism of amino acids can go via two main routes, which are called deamination and transamination. Okay? Does that make sense? Now, in the process of deamination, ammonia is produced. So, it's ammonia. That's minus. So, like, ammonium leaves. So, here's another interesting case. So, if you eat high protein, not necessarily high fat, but high protein, low carb diet, your organism will have to run check this out, on the products of amino acid catabolism. Does that make sense? Are you following me? So you, let's say, you exclude carbohydrates, you exclude fats, and all you leave on some, you know, leafy greens, which have like zero calories in them, and like spinach and protein shake. Okay, does that make sense? So you have a lot of protein coming in. You still need to generate energy. And this energy will be generated from the amino acids by deamination or transamination. During that generation of energy, the ammonia that is being produced as the result will be excreted in the form of urea from your, through your kidneys. Does that make sense? Are you following me? First of all, it gives a, a very kind of a little bit of a strange smell to the urine because of the large amount of ammonia derivatives that are being excreted second. Uh, I don't know if you, like, people, especially teens and, and young men and women who try to build muscle and they consume large amounts of protein, right, they always walk around with it big jugs of water because they thirsty because in order to remove ammonia remove urea from the body through the kidneys your body has to produce a lot of urine so essentially it's kind of you know a vicious cycle so to say you know they consume a lot of fluid to wash it away therefore they pee a lot you know and they thirsty because they produce all the urea that makes sense but what's more important, you know, uh, you may read some cows like, uh, for instance, how much protein a person who's trying to build muscle should consume. And general recommendation of like one gram of protein per pound of body weight. Um, more realistic is 1.5. So for a person of my size, it will be something like 240, 250 grams of protein a day. Unless I eat cows it's almost impossible to consume it normally from food. So we're talking, this is why people use protein shakes, right? And another important, very important thing about this, this whole protein story is when people just think, oh, I'm going to just eat, you know, steaks and down them with protein shakes. It's not going to work as well because in order to build muscles, athletes have to consume substantial amount of carbohydrates as well. Does that make sense? So basically, carbs or fats, it doesn't matter, carbs or fats, you can use either, will be used as a source of energy. So that spares amino acids, you following me? To actually be used for protein synthesis, for muscle buildup, and so on and so forth. Does that make sense? Say again? When athletes are low on energy, are they low on like carbohydrates and fats? Well, define low on energy. When they are tired, they're just tired. <laughs> That's tired. Like if you if you 
are low in energy after two hours of, of training. That is not low in energy. Like you can eat a cake and you're still going to be tired. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying is in order to build muscles, athletes have to supply a substantial amount of energy either through carbohydrates or triglycerides. That makes sense. So the proteins can be actually used for protein synthesis. Does that make sense? Now, what last little bit that I wanted to highlight. Um, basically, all of these processes, all of the energy converting processes happen in mitochondria, except for glycolysis, this part. Okay? That happens in the cytoplasm of the cell. The main glycogen storage organs are liver and muscles. Does that make sense? And most of these reactions can go both ways. So look at this. If look, just follow me. So if you consume fat, fat is broken down to glycerol and fatty acids, right? and glycerol is converted to G3P, G3P can be used to make glucose. Am I clear? Or it can be used to make pyruvate, and it will be used for both processes. Does that make sense? Basically, chemical equilibrium is what guides this process, as well as, as, well as uh, expression of certain genes, production of enzymes that facilitate forward or reverse process. Are we clear? Questions? Can you train your brain to, like, use, instead of wanting glucose, can you train it to use, like, ketone bodies or, like, anything else? Eventually it will. If you, like, if you will deprive yourself long enough, your brain will switch to ketone metabolism. Yeah. It will. And are there, like, negative side effects to doing that? That's a great question. Um, the problem with, um, let me 